It's time for the 1430 Connection on 1430 WNAV and 99.9 FM. Spotlighting news, newsmakers, and important community issues. Now, with this week's edition of the 1430 Connection, here is WNAV news anchor Donna Cole. Welcome to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. Today I have the pleasure of again speaking to Glenn Fuston. He's the executive director of the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention, Youth, and Victim Services. Glenn, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having us again, Donna. It's no surprise to you, but we've been living with this pandemic for quite a few months now, and I would guess quite a few things have changed for you in the office. Uh, for one, we're not speaking in person. We're talking on a phone. So what has changed for you for the Office of Crime Prevention, Youth and Victim Services in crime? I believe that uh, we've seen some crime rates go up. You tell me you're the expert and you are the data guy. Yes, yeah, certainly. So uh, we have certainly seen some changes. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I think for our staff and uh, for all the those that we work with and for, you know, everybody's at home now. So we all had to make adjustments there uh, to make sure that we are still delivering our services efficiently and uh, effectively, uh, but that we're all still taking care of our own families and our own children and um, making sure that they're uh, healthy and safe. And then also working with the constituents across Maryland on the, the new normal, as you and I talked about, just uh, briefly, uh, you know, people are still um, at home a lot. So delivery of service, how do we get the same services that they used to go into buildings for? How do we get to them in person? Uh, so we're really happy that the, you know, the governor has uh, created several initiatives, uh, you know, one of them being the, um, the rural broadband project, uh, which is now even ex- expanded to uh, urban as well, where we're providing funding to get, um, Uh, broadband internet access to everybody in the state of Maryland. So that's been a big help. That's a big deal. And you also, you oversee the Maryland Criminal Intelligence Network, yes? We do, yes. What are you seeing with rates right now? We're hearing about more crimes in our communities. So what's the data telling you? In terms of violent crime, unfortunately, we are seeing some spikes. Uh, We see that in the city of Baltimore. We've seen that in Annapolis, uh, right here local to us. Uh, we're seeing these uh, spikes in violent crime. We're also seeing uh, some increases in uh, some of the domestic crimes that uh, are really concerning us that are directly related to our office, like domestic violence, uh, sexual assault, child abuse, and the like. Um, you know, we're seeing that um, these victims are stuck oftentimes uh, with their abusers, and if we don't find ways for them to get out uh, and, and away from the abusers, uh, that ab- abuse continues, and that's uh, something we're certainly working on. So how has your office changed because of this during the pandemic when you're delivering services online right now? Yeah, so, you know, we're certainly delivering services online. Uh, we're, we're developing ways for victims to uh, communicate online uh, with their um, service providers. A lot of service providers have received funding uh, to deliver counseling and uh, education and, um, and, and the like via online services. But we also worked with the governor very early on to make sure that places like uh, domestic violence shelters uh, were designated as essential so that these victims were able to separate themselves from their abusers. Uh, So that was really key. And, you know, I think that it was um, very surprising for some as as COVID continues to unfold, uh, but especially early on, how many different places it touches that we might not have thought about. You know, it's, it's not just not going to school and not going to work, but all of these different services that are Um, or ramped up uh, from in-person contact had to change and find a new normal. The other big question that's always on a lot of people's minds is this this line between law enforcement and mental health, right? There's not Mm -hmm. enough mental health providers. We know that there's been there before the pandemic there was a, a huge shortage in mental health providers. We know that there's an increased need for mental health providers. We're seeing some of these crime rates go up which probably in part is driven by this need for mental health. Governor Hogan, uh, early on in uh, 2016, matter of fact, uh, signed into law the Justice Reinvestment Act. And the Justice Reinvestment Act uh, was a very comprehensive uh, crime reform, in in my opinion, where we were really looking at on the surface, we were looking at let's reduce the prison population uh, is, is what people look at it and reinvest that savings back into crime prevention. 
Uh, in that cycle, uh, what we have done is we do a lot of work with diversion and deflection programs, uh, one, so that when people touch the criminal justice system, both as youth and adults, how do we deflect them away from incarceration or um, are, are being locked up? How do we get them into programming that's going to help them with mental health issues? Uh, so we certainly are touching that and, and working on that. And I would also, I know that we're going to talk about it, the, the Boys and Girls Clubs and other youth development centers, these types of programs, I think, work with young people in our community uh, to, um, uh, to give them positive um, outlets uh, and work on their mental health uh, so that they're, uh, they, they can avoid some of the criminal aspects that, uh, that we're talking about today. All right, let's talk about the Boys and Girls Club. As soon as we get back from this break, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. I have the pleasure of speaking with Glenn Fuston. He's the Executive Director of the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention, Youth, and Victim Services. Glenn, on October 7th of this year, Governor Hogan announced that a $3.4 million assistance grant called the Edward J. Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant was being awarded for local projects that support efforts to reduce crime in Maryland. Half of the funding will be allocated to who? Half of the funding is going to go to the Boys and Girls Club of America, and we're really excited about that. And the Maryland Alliance the, and the Boys and Girls Club of Metropolitan Baltimore for clubs throughout the area, yes? Yeah, sorry, yeah. We're actually we're able to create an alliance of all the uh, Boys and Girls Clubs across the state. Uh, so in each of the counties that has a club, uh, up to 34 different clubs that are uh, uh, already operating, creating an alliance among all of them so that uh, they could come together, standardize this evidence-based programming, and deliver services. We're also going to be able to open, uh, we hope, to up into eight new clubs. That's actually incredible. And one of the things that I found interesting, going back to this Maryland Criminal Intelligence Network, let's define what that is and define how that then has a relationship with where this money is going. Certainly. So the Maryland Criminal Intelligence Network, or EMSIN, is a uh, collaboration of law enforcement and criminal justice agencies that are working across the state uh, in areas that we have identified have um, a higher number of repeat violent offenders, and specifically repeat violent offenders that are working together in uh, organizations, so gangs, criminal organizations, and the like. And that entity, those law enforcement officers, those prosecutors, uh, and in even uh, mental health, we talked about that in our uh, earlier segment, uh, and with the victim service provider, they're all working together to identify these criminal organizations, uh, identify them, and then disrupt and dismantle them. And then what we're finding, though, is after they've disrupted or dismantled these criminal organizations, unfortunately, those organizations play a negative role in our communities with our children. And what we want to do is fill that void that's created after we've removed that criminal network out of the community. We want to fill that void with a positive uh, influence. And we're filling those voids by bringing Boys and Girls Clubs into every community that we have one of the Maryland Criminal Intelligence Networks in. So we're bolstering the, um, the preventive nature, the uh, care that we can provide uh, to our children. Uh, and we're also bringing victim services aspect to it. So we're really proud of that, that trifecta uh, or a comprehensive approach to crime reduction uh, across the state of Maryland. Now, I, I alluded to this already in this interview, and we talked about it during the last interview last year. You are a data guy. This is data being put to use. You know where the problems are, and this funding is going right into where those problems are. It, you said there's going to be 40 club locations in Anne Arundel County, Allegheny County, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Cecil County, Calvert County, Carroll, Dorchester, Frederick, Harford, Prince George's, Montgomery, and Washington County. You know exactly where the problems were, so you know where, where to put the money, right? Yeah, we're, we're really happy that uh, I am a data ga guy. Uh, you know, a lot of people call me Mr. Big Data or something to that effect, but, uh, you know, the governor has supported us in utilizing uh, data-driven approaches to not only identify where the problem is, uh, what we have with those counties that you identified, but also identify programs that we know that are effective. So evidence-based programming on the, by the mere nature, we know the, via data that these programs work, and we can show the statistics that's showing 
that having a Boys and Girls Club in your community uh, has an impact, that these IMSN programs has an impact. And then at the end of it, we can measure our impact in those communities. So, we should, so the specific dollars that went into those communities, how did we impact that? And, uh, you know, I think that that's a, a really responsible way to uh, utilize the taxpayer dollar. So let me ask you, it has an impact on the early childhood years, yes? What happens to the group that is aging out? Certainly. So our programs with the Boys and Girls Clubs, um, they uh, address uh, girls, you know, 8, eight to 17, boys 11 to 14 for some different programs. But you're right, after they age out of their program, what we are seeing, the science is telling us, uh, is that uh, if there's a reduction in adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, and this is a study that was done several years ago um, by Kaiser Permanente uh, and uh, a few others, that showed that if we can reduce these adverse childhood experiences in children, which are neglect, abuse, uh, and the like, that they have a lower propensity to health problems, to criminal justice problems, to problems in the community as a whole. So we can see that via the data that by engaging with these boys and girls clubs, which in turn reduces adverse childhood experiences, which will in turn, as they age out, reduce their impact and negative impact in the communities. We'll be right back on the 1430 Connection. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. I'm talking today with Glenn Fuston. He's the Executive Director of the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention, Youth and Victim Services. We're talking about a grant, a $3.4 million grant that's going to, uh, well, it says allow 5,000 young people in Maryland to participate in evidence-based and evidence-informed youth development programs at nearly 40 club locations throughout the state. What are those youth development programs? Tell me what they look like, what they feel like. Tell me why a 12-year-old should be excited about this. Thank you for asking that question because it's something that we're really trying to get out there. I think a lot of times people think of the Boys and Girls Clubs as a place where uh, kids go play basketball uh, in their sports center, and they're certainly a tie to sports. Uh, We have a great partnership with uh, Badges to Baseball program or Police Athletic Leagues. Um, But the type of programming that uh, these um, children are getting is incredible. Uh, We have programs like uh, Passport to Manhood, Smart Girls, and these are uh, programs that are providing positive influence to these children uh, while they're out there having fun with their friends. They're learning social behaviors. They're learning how to interact with um, kids that are their same age and with adults. And then again, as I mentioned, we have Police Athletic League Connection, which allows them to interact directly with law enforcement officers in our community and build that positive relationship with uh, an adult, and in this case, specifically um, law enforcement uh, in the community. There's other programs like uh, Target Outreach, My Future, Torch Club, Healthy Habits. Uh, So there's all sorts of different programs that they can do, as as well as getting help uh, with schoolwork, and uh, and then, of course, play some basketball. I was looking at the Boys and Girls Club Instagram for Baltimore, and it looks like Under Armour just provided some laptops for some of the kids. Private partnerships also coming into play here. Is that a thought for more of that? 100%. It's something that the governor uh, and our office has really been uh, encouraging through these programs, and it's something uh, we actually encouraged um, these programs to get together. We do this through all of our different disciplines, through, so through law enforcement and victim services, to bring these alliances together so that we can show that we're all working together as a community to, to have positive impact. And in, in this case, you're seeing that public-private impact, uh, or partnerships, sorry, uh, with Under Armour, but there is other partnerships with uh, the healthcare systems. Uh, I was just at a, a meeting with some of the Boys and Girls Clubs, and they were able to purchase a van uh, to take the Boys and Girls Club activity into the communities. Uh, you know, so we talked about virtual, but now they're actually able to take these vans into the communities, and they're, get, they're partnering up with healthcare providers to bring uh, vaccinations in. They're bringing in mental health evaluators. They're bringing in computers, as you mentioned, for um, uh, homework help or for even for job interview and, uh, and, and research purposes. So the collaboration and partnership is huge. I think we know uh, and we talk to the Boys and Girls Club and they know that the, you know, the Boys and Girls Club is not the single answer. It's a part of the solution in collaboration with the rest of the community. Because of the pandemic, we had, uh, you know, some unemployment issues or underemployment issues. Is this something that you're looking into for, for the 19, 20, 21-year-olds? 
A hundred percent. So, I mean, we continue to work uh, with um, the Department of Labor, the Department of Commerce uh, at the, the state of Maryland uh, to try to develop, um, you know, job skills uh, and opportunities for these young adults uh, as they're uh, getting out of college to help with where they're going to move and go in their careers and their, and their jobs in the future. So it's certainly something we want to talk about. There's other opportunities. Uh, we also talked about with the Boys and Girls Clubs about uh, taking trips uh, to different um, industries so that they can be exposed to um, different industries. For example, uh, taking children from Baltimore uh, out to Allegheny County and children from Allegheny County down to Baltimore so they can experience the different businesses and different um, opportunities that exist in uh, different places. Actually, now that you're on that, T.J. Smith, do you know the name T.J. Smith? I certainly do. Very good. He had mentioned on Twitter a few months back how much he, because of his own child, how much he thought it would be great to have a fishing pier or two in the city, someplace to take his own kid. Oh, 100%. And we're, we're constantly looking into this. We're looking at... Um, you know, how we can partner with our, our locals to develop those types of opportunities. Uh, so, you know, I think that we're certainly a funding uh, person uh, and a partner with uh, the, the community, but we want them to think of those types of ideas. They know the area. They know the community. They know what their children would benefit from the most, but 100% we'd be interested in those types of programming. All right. Well, then I'll mention it to him next time I see him on Twitter. What, um, what is on your to-do list, Glenn? I'm sure that you must have a huge to-do list. Yes, I certainly have a huge to-do list. You know, I think in, in, in this area, one of the things that we continue to do uh, is build collaboration. Uh, we want uh, to work in and among the three specific disciplines that the governor has asked our office to focus on, which is law enforcement or criminal justice. It's the victim services community, and it's our youth and family. Uh, on my to-do list is to continue to make sure that we are bringing those three groups together to collaborate, to do whatever we can in the state of Maryland to have a safer Maryland. Uh, and I think that working in partnership and collaboration with folks that have different thoughts, that have different beliefs is a huge component to that. So that's certainly on my to-do list. I think the other thing that's on my to-do list uh, is to make sure that we continue to use data to effectively allocate dollars to programs that work and to measure the impact that they're having. Did we speak about the websites, the Maryland State websites, the last time we talked and how they're a little bit antiquated and looking at future? <laughs> yes, we did. Okay. We, so. we may have mentioned that, Donna. Okay. So. <laughs> Just want to make sure we mention that, and so since we did, it might be a good time to bring it up. Any any discussion on where we're going with the Maryland State websites and making, because there's great ways of looking at data on websites. There's beautiful ways of putting it on websites. Well, you know, I think that uh, there's a couple of websites that do a very good job. So, I mean, there's the Maryland Open Data Portal uh, that I think does a great job of getting data out there. Uh, I think as a whole, I think we're certainly looking at all of our different websites and seeing how they can be monetized. We're working with uh, the Department of IT to make sure that that happens. Not only uh, they uh, are more um, accessible, but they're more standardized. Um, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of really good information that you can you can gather from some of these websites. Um, but we'll certainly uh, continue to look into that. What have I missed that you would like to relay to people, um, especially about the Boys and Girls Clubs right now? What, how, how, how can people get involved? You know, you know, I think that the best way to, to get involved uh, right now is just to keep continuing to pay attention to uh, our families, to our children, uh, and, uh, and looking for uh, opportunities to, um, to engage as a whole. You know, COVID's impacting us in ways we don't even know yet. Uh, and I think that the more that we can engage and, uh, and communicate with one another, the better. And Boys and Girls Club is certainly an, uh, an avenue for that. Looking for your local clubs, getting your children involved would be great. And your website for more information about your office? gocp.maryland.gov. Gwen, thank you for spending some time with me today. I really appreciate it. Don, thank you very much for uh, helping us get this information out and, uh, and keeping our community safe. My pleasure. This is Donna Cole on the 1430 Connection. We will see you next week. 